Oh my goodness. Oh, Suzanne, you have been such a loyal attendee. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Suzanne, are you in the summer of pod challenge? For me? Oh, um, no, I don't think so. I should. <laughs> yeah. It's your last day to register. Oh, okay. I'll definitely do that after. Thank you. Yeah. I'll drop that in our chat box. Well, this is exciting. Okay. It's been two minutes. Is that enough? Should I go ahead and get started, Kat? Um, get I just changed my Wi-Fi. Sorry. Okay, cool. I was like, yeah. frozen smile. No, Is here. that a yes or a no? <laughs> I'm here. I give it. I give the people. I give the masses two more minutes. One more minute. Two more minutes. Wonderful. We are very timely, which I appreciate. But. I'm gonna do one more surf through. Yes, I'm going to make sure nobody is missing our link. It looks like we might have solved that problem. And we are going live on Facebook. And I'll be made um, throughout the throughout the presentation. Um, you can also save for after Tilden presents. So just remember that. And for Tilden, those I'm going to introduce you before. So don't worry. You'll <laughs> yes. <introduce> you. <laughs> you will know. And for those of you on Facebook, you can chat your questions, and we will keep an eye on that as well. Okay. Time? Yeah, All right. Kick it off. Sure. Welcome, everybody, to our third Summer of Pod community class. Uh, these courses are going alongside our Women of Color podcast incubator. Uh, for those of you who are in, um, incubator participants, will you wave on your screen so we can see that you are here? Maylene and Javon are here also, but they are, yeah, and Karen, um, but they don't have their faces showing. But yeah, let's just give them a round of applause quietly behind your muted screen. We love you. Good job. You're, you're doing amazing. Um, so we are so excited to be making all of these courses free and pay what you can to our community and Facebook living them so that everyone who is dreaming of making a show, who's struggling with making a show, or who's rocking it and just needs a little bit more fuel in the rocket um, is, you know, just feeling connected because during COVID and during social and civil unrest, we are just needing each other more and more to continue to create good and important art and tell important stories. Um, and so we are excited to be amplifying more voices um, and specifically to have Tobin with us. So I'm going to give um, Kat the floor to introduce Tobin. The last thing I just want to say is a reminder of our Zoom etiquette. <laughs> so welcome, we're glad you're here. Be mindful of your mute button, um, particularly while Tobin is presenting. And please feel free to add comments in the chat, um, per um, particularly for questions afterwards. We will have a good segment of Q&A. And um, you're welcome to use the raising hand feature and the Facebook features, and I will do my best to just be here and available for all of that good um, participation. So. Take it away, Kat. Okay. Mine will be short because my dogs play in the background and they are the squeaky toy culprits of every Zoom call. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I just wanna add one thing about the Summer of Pod Challenge, which is so exciting. Today's the last day to register. And if you do register and you produce a podcast between July 1st and August 31st, we'll give you a free year long membership to House of Pod. Um, if you have the highest or most reviews on Apple Podcasts. That's kind of the requirement. So it's really about connecting with your community, getting your show out there, taking that plunge, and we will reward you. And for those of you who aren't big social media fans or don't have an obsessive following, 
that's fine. You're still a winner. You're going to come out with a show that you're excited about. And that's really what matters most. So register today if you want to be um, in consideration for that. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Tobin. Uh, I have been a fan since Nancy and Tobin released this awesome story about a teenage drag queen in Alaska. Um, that was the first time and I met Tobin and Nancy or Kathy, I'm sorry, at Third Coast and it was a big deal. Um, I've always kind of been a little bit of a fangirl, um, especially because Tobin graduated from uh, the transom program that also helped me get my kick off in radio as well. Um, Tobin has had a, an illustrious career from working with the first season of More Perfect to then launching um, their own show, Nancy, which has been an incredible space in the podcasting community for people coming out and owning their identities and their truths and their personal experiences. Um, and now it is sad and exciting. Um, Nancy has had its final season. The last episode was released and Tobin is continuing on to work with Radio Lab, which is an exciting new chapter. So we're so excited to have them here. And um, yeah, with, oh, also I just have to give a plug for the episode that Nancy did. Um, and recorded it at House of Pod, which was really pretty exciting. Um, it's an amazing story about, uh, well, Tobin can also go into it, but it's an amazing story about a community that maybe a lot of people don't know about, teen, teen drag, which is super cool. Um, and if you want to take a look at that episode, it's called Dress of Choice, and it's amazing. And I don't know if you'll even recognize Denver in it. Um, it's such a great perspective and really cool use of personal experience on the street and interview. Becca will link it in the chat. So without further ado, Tobin, thank you so much for joining us. The Zoom is yours. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I think you're underselling my relationship to House of Pod, which is that you all saved my butt on my reporting trip because I showed up and my the person I was supposed to interview was like, understandably so she was like no I will not be interviewed at your hotel that sounds weird and I was like fair so then it was like a scramble to find a space and I sent an email last minute to House of Pod and you all were like yes absolutely show up uh, and then I showed up and my kit stopped working and you lent me a kit so I am forever indebted to House of Pod for like pretty much saving that entire story <laughs> but uh anyway yeah uh, hi Hi all, uh, I'm Tobin. Um, I am, I guess I now say formally the co-host of Nancy, uh, which was an LGBTQ storytelling podcast. Um, we just dropped our last episode on Monday, as you heard, and that's after a hundred plus episodes. We just passed the hundred mark before we uh, ended the show, or the show was ended, I should say. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's been three years of doing um, LGBTQ stories. Um, before that, I did the first season of More Perfect, which was the Supreme Court podcast uh, from Radio Lab. And then before that, I was at Marketplace as like a digital production assistant and sort of freelance reporting. Um, so that's sort of my radio trajectory to this point. Um, before we jump in, I want to say, please do drop as many questions as possible in the chat. I, I have a little song and dance that I'm going to do about, um, you know, how we do stories, but I, I like these things much more when they're a conversation, um, and I'm happy to answer questions about whatever. Um, we can talk about pitching a show, we can talk about, you know, like sort of building a show from the ground up, all that kind of stuff is great. Um, I'm happy to do any of that. Um, Okay, so with that said, I do have a little bit of a something and I'm going to now navigate to share screen, Matt, share computer sound, share. Okay, and now I'm going to, oh right, okay, here we go, here we go. Can I get a thumbs up if everyone is seeing the parrot? Okay, great. Um, another disclaimer I'm going to say about this presentation is I never know what to do with the images. So these are stock zoo animal images. Uh, they have pretty much nothing to do with my presentation, but they're fun to look at, aren't they? Look at this parrot. 
this parrot is gorgeous. Um, okay. So um, what I want to say about Nancy to start is that because we were covering a community, the LGBTQ community and ourselves often, um, there was this thing that we encountered a lot that our feeling that our stories often started with feelings. They often started with um, sort of people really wanting to talk about very personal stuff that they had been thinking about or dealing with um, inside. And that we found out pretty quickly is really hard to turn into a story because feelings are squishy and they're sort of interior. And how do you turn that into something that somebody else wants to listen to? Um, so that's sort of what I wanna to talk to you about today is sort of what we figured out about how to do that. Oh, and, uh, gonna go to the next slide, okay, great. Um, these are all feelings that turned into stories for us. Uh, so, uh, I feel weird about my body. I'm afraid of the word butch. Uh, I'm tired of coming out to my mom all the time. What do they think about me? Um, and I guess it, it might be pretty obvious, but these are, they don't sort of have all the trappings of a usual story, which is, it's great when someone comes to you and says, I want to do a story about this person. They did X, Y, and Z. And they did this first step, and then it led to the second step, and then the third step, and then resolution. Right? Feeling stories don't have any of that. They start with just a thought. Um, so what I want to share with you is some of the tricks we figured out to give it some of, that, some of those trappings of feeling like you're going from step one to step two to step three. Um, so I'm going to spend some time with each of these questions, but I feel like it's worth just sort of giving you a layout of questions we started to ask ourselves on Nancy when we got these stories. Um, let me just make sure. Um, the worst thing about a feelings -y story is if it feels like somebody is telling you about a dream they had, right? Like when someone's like, I had a dream and I want to tell you about it. And you're like, I could care less about what you're telling me right now. It's so self-indulgent, it's so whatever. So I, I find that these questions, what you're trying to do is you're trying to add tension that someone will care about into your story. Um, and by asking yourself these questions, you are introducing tension. You're introducing dramatic tension that will then give you some narrative thrust. Um, so these questions are like, can you locate a question that your main character is trying to answer? Um, who might challenge you on how you think about the question? Is there a scene you can create where you put your feelings in a time and a place? Um, who is closest to the feeling? Who is it most real for? And then the last bit we'll also talk about uh, is to get an editor, not a therapist. Um, do get a therapist also, but when you're doing the story, get an editor. Um, Cool. Is that all I wanted to say about this slide? Yeah. Oh, I guess the other thing I want to say is like for any of you that are reporters or have reporting experience, like these are pretty basic tenets of reporting, right? Like they're pretty like ABC, but I find that for whatever reason, when you're doing the feelings, these stories, it's so effing hard to figure out the answers to these. So it's worth just like talking about them and wrestling with them because they're not as, the answers are not as obvious. Um, cool, so let's jump into this first question. Um, and for this one, I'm gonna talk about an episode that we did called Fear of Being Butch. Um, and this was an episode that my co-host Kathy did. Um, and it started with her just sort of coming into our story pitch meeting um, and talking about her discomfort with the word butch, like using the word, being associated with the word. Um, and so we just started like pulling apart that feeling with her of, you know, what are the parts of that? Why, 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 why? Um, and eventually we sort of got to this place where she was talking about her childhood and things her mom said to her as a kid about her appearance. Um, and I think in just talking about that and the um, trying to go from feeling to a question, we figured out that the question is, why was Kathy herself so afraid of being butch? Um, 
and that, that one's pretty simple, right? Like it seems like pretty obvious, but I think it's so important to just articulate that before you get into your reporting, because then it feels like you're moving towards something. You're trying to answer something. It gives you a destination to go towards. Um, so for this one, once we located the question of what, like, why am I so afraid of looking butch? Um, we were able to uh, put Kathy in a room with this other great radio producer. Uh, their name is Rachel Matlow. Um, they themselves are non-binary and they've thought a lot about butch. They're sort of like further along down the road than Kathy and thinking about this. Um, and they had just an amazing conversation about Kathy's fear. Um, I'm gonna play you a clip of that. I think passing is a safety blanket. I think that being butch means basically screaming out to the world that you're gay and there's no real hiding from it. It's, it's not wanting to stand out and just wanting to be left alone to, you know, live the life that I want. That is the safety that comes with passing. Mm -hmm. which, which is great if you feel comfortable, but then if you're not feeling comfortable with how you're presenting or, or you're having a desire to and you're holding that back, then I guess the question is like, at what cost? Right. Yeah. And, and I think and I, I think the the reason that I keep thinking about this is because I, I just I don't know. And I don't want to be a person that hates something just just to hate it for no no reason or to be scared of something and not really like kind of tackle it. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I should be a lot more like you than the way I present now. And if I never I, if I never step into those shoes and, and see what that's like. Am I not, can, can I be happier? Well, what are you thinking, Kathy? How do you think you can become happier? Um, I think, I think that, honestly, I think that I, I have to cut my hair. Just gonna lean into your, your butchness. Yeah. Take the plunge. Oh, that sounds so scary. Um, yeah, so as you hear, that, uh, that episode ended up ending with Kathy getting a haircut. And I think that came out of having that question that sort of led her on a path. And then there was something sort of to go towards, which ended up being this haircut. Um, so again, a very simple concept. Identify the question you're moving towards, um, but it's something a lot of people seem to or tend to miss when they're doing these feelings, these stories. Um, the last thing I wanna say before we move on from this slide, um, I think sometimes people are afraid of the idea of identifying a question because it, the, the fear is, do I have to answer that question by the end? Like, do I have to deliver on that? And I think especially for feelings these stories, the answer is no. You don't have to answer the question I think it's fine enough and in fact a more satisfying ending if the person you're following feels differently about the question than when they started. And that is, that's like an emotional journey that you can track. And, I, and actually I think more true to life, right? That like most people don't get concrete answers to these big questions they have in their lives. They just start feeling differently about why they're asking them and what it means in their life. Um, so don't be afraid to sort of say what the question is because you don't necessarily have to like wrap it up in a bow by the end. There just has to be some kind of transformation, I think. Um, okay, cool. The next episode I'm gonna talk about is a story I did called The Swimsuit Issue. Um, and I think this is an example of a question you should be asking yourself, which is who might challenge you on how you think about your question that you have. I think with these kinds of stories, especially if you're sort of setting them up to be a journey, there's a temptation to sort of just find people who will be your therapist, who will sort of like guide you and love you and support you and sort of help you get to where you need to be. Um, but again, I think if you're trying to introduce tension, um, I think sometimes the best thing you can do is to find somebody who maybe has the same feeling but comes at it from a different direction or will challenge you about your feeling. Um, and that's, they're, they're not necessarily your villain, but they're just sort of something to push against, right? It's like, so it introduces story tension. Um, so the example that I would use in this, in this 
uh, this episode is uh, I started from a place of I have huge body insecurity as a gay man. I just like have always hated my body, et cetera, et cetera. And in talking about it with my team in a story pitch meeting and sort of talking about the parts of it, I admitted that I had this old coworker um, and his name is Sabri. And Sabri is jacked. He is like so frigging muscular. And he, uh, because we are friends and coworkers, he would invite me to, um, he had pool parties a lot for his uh, like birthdays or whatever. And by following him on Instagram, I knew that pretty much everyone who showed up to these parties looked like Sabri. And so over the years, I would always make up an excuse. I would always say like, oh, I'm so, oh shoot, I'm busy that night. I can't do it. Uh, but really the reason was I just didn't want to be around the muscular bodies and whatnot. So in talking about the body insecurity, it became this thing of like, well, actually Sabri would be a really interesting person to talk to about it. Um, and so I brought him into the studio and we ended up having this conversation. <sighs> okay. It's good to see you. It's really good to see you too. It's been a really long time. Yeah. This is Sabri. He's a friend and former coworker. I used to be his intern. Yep. Best one there ever was. No, but for real, one, one of absolutely <laughs> the best. Uh, so basically, I'm working on a story about how uh, I hate my body, always have. Hmm. And one of the reasons I want to talk to you is because I think if I were to imagine what my perfect body would look like or the body I imagine I would have and feel okay about it or good about it, it is uh, it is your body, Sabri. <laughs> okay. Um... I think, thank you. I think that's nice, but that's also, um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Why are you thinking about this? Well, I, it's a thing that I feel bad about, which is that like you over the years have been very sweet to me and invite me to a lot of things like pool parties and, and all of that. And if I'm being totally honest, um, because I follow you on Instagram, I have tended to say no and made up an excuse, but the actual reason is um, your friends are very muscular <laughs> and I'm very self-conscious about it. Um, and I, I don't know. And I know that's my shit. That's not your shit. But that's like a thing that I feel very weird about. I don't know. Uh, you know that you are the third friend to say that to me. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially with that pool party that I threw. I feel bad about that. Um, and the rest of that part of the story is us talking about our, like how both of us have body issues and how we're both weird about it. Um, and I, I don't know, I just love that tape because I feel like, uh, it, it gave tension and sort of like, like you into like, you're kind of wondering what Sabri is going to say, uh, and how he's going to react and all of that. Um, and so that gave the story some actual thrust. It actually gave it something interesting for you to find out. Um, so again, thinking about the people who will introduce tension for you with your feelings is a great way to add some structure to these kinds of stories. Um, and then again, the other, the other hot tip, which is maybe sort of obvious, is always try to save epiphanic moments for tape. In this case, I very much waited to say anything to Sabri until we were in studio on tape. Um, so that kind of stuff is gold. And, and you don't tend to have a lot of it with feelings these stories. So when you sort of are thinking about how you're going to report them out, um, identifying what those moments are and prioritizing getting them on tape because they're gold and they're kind of few and far between for these kinds of stories. Um, okay. Uh, this one is called, does it bring you joy? Um, you know, as I've been like harping on feelings, these stories, it's all interior, right? Like it's all pl taking place in your heart and your mind. Um, which is, it's hard because then you have to do so much work to get somebody in there with you. So I think one of the most important questions you can try to answer is like, is there a way that I can take this out of my body and like sort of display it in a time and a place, like in a scene? Um, so for me, uh, again, this, this all started in a story meeting, just talking through 
feelings. Um, I told my team that I noticed my voice was getting tired a lot. Uh, and I had a theory that it was because I was so afraid of being seen as femme when I was a teenager that I just started forcing my voice down. And so this was like this theory and this feeling I had. Um, and so then we figured out that one of the places that I could sort of like bring that out and just make it into a scene is to, um, I ended up going to a speech therapist and having her like officially analyze if this was indeed the case. Uh, so this is that tape. Eventually, Dr. Block pulls the results from the tests, and she gets out this chart that shows the different registers where people speak. Up at the top is the highest voices, and down at the bottom is the lowest. And there's a bunch of shaded regions that show where different groups of people tend to speak. Towards the top is a shaded area for cis women's voices, and down at the bottom is cis men's voices. That's the area she points to for my voice. Yes. And I was at kind of the bottom of that block. Exactly. Which I think does not serve your vocal health very well. And this is why you are having the fatigue and the hoarseness. I think you're forcing it down. I think you could move your pitch around more when you talk. Dr. Block I says, I basically are... have become very good at faking it in my lower register. She says that for most people, when they make themselves speak lower, they end up sounding kind of monotone. How are you? I am speaking very deeply. But Dr. Block says, I've managed to find a way to force my voice down while also having some ups and downs. It makes it sound more natural. I mean, I have had years of practice, so that makes sense to me. Yeah, so again, taking something that's interior sort of happening in my head and like putting it in a doctor's office scene or putting it in, um, I guess with the swimsuit issue, like putting it in that conversation with Sabri, um, with Kathy's butch story, like putting it into a haircut, um, something where there's action that people can follow, I think is so essential for, for this kind of thing. Um, and I think I accidentally left the same point from the last slide on this slide. So I will skip over that. We already talked about the epiphanic moment. Um, okay. Um, this idea, I think, is something we, and a lot of shows, um, have really held dearly, is this idea of passing the mic. Um, and the idea of asking who the feeling is closest to. Like, who is it most real for? And what do you get by removing the people who it's not real for, right? So uh, the example I want to point to is an episode we did called, called Here's What It's Like. Um, and it started with one of our coworkers. His name's David Gable. He's in his 60s. Um, and he uh, lived through the HIV AIDS crisis in New York in the 80s um, and has been HIV positive since then. Uh, and he came to us one day and said, you should do a story about young men who have HIV now, because I don't know what their experience is, and I don't know if they truly understand what we went through in the 80s. Um, and so we sort of like toyed around with like, okay, how do we do that? How do we like tell that story? Um, and then this idea came up of like, well, what if we just let David do that conversation? Or what if we just had David do that conversation? And what do we get by removing Kathy and myself from that room? and just letting them talk uh, instead. Um, so I'm gonna play you a clip of, oh, and so the person he ended up talking to was uh, Dominique, who uh, um, was in his 30s and worked at the gay men's health crisis in New York. When you hear someone my age talk about the 80s or what it was like or everybody was dying, what do you think? We're still dying. It's just that it's different. Um, I think a lot of, I, I see a lot of my young black youth dying still to this day. Now it changed. The, the communities that that are dying um, changed. Mm -hmm. So and it's not talked about as often, and, but it's still around. AIDS crisis is still around. How many friends of, you, of yours have you lost? So many. I've lost so many people. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, 
people say, you know, it's not the 80s anymore. Um, people not dying from it. And yes, they are. Um, I think if I had to a label, if I had to label what I think is maybe like the single most powerful bit of tape we ever got for the show, it's the, it's, it's David saying, I'm sorry in that one moment because it's it's truly like something only he can offer in that moment because they share this experience. David knows what that's like. Um, and so I think for us, that was a huge learning experience of like for every story asking, like, do we actually need to be in this room? Because um, again, I think with feelings, these stories, what you're trying to do is you're trying to create electricity. You're trying to make something feel real and authentic. Um, and sometimes if you remove the reporter or the host for whom it's not real, um, that gets you to a place where it does have that electricity. Um, so for us on Nancy, we thought a lot about, especially with the feelings these stories, like how do we get the extraneous people out of the room? Um, and that, that will make your story or your episode or whatever feel so much more like you're being led into a space that you might not otherwise occupy. Um, and I don't know, it just builds empathy in a really beautiful way. Um, okay, I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> right, so this is, um, this is from our very, very first episode. Um, and maybe I'll just start by playing the tape. This, is, this comes from a story that Kathy did uh, my co-host Kathy did, um, and it started with the um, the feeling that I put up at the top of the presentation about I'm tired of coming out to my mom, um, because <clears throat> because what happened in Kathy is she has a Taiwanese mother, and she had come out to her three times, and her mom had just sort of completely avoided the topic each time, and so there was this like barrier where Kathy's mom just wasn't hearing her, and they she wasn't feeling understood, and so finally she like opened up Google Translate, got out her microphone and recorded sort of like to her what she felt like was her final attempt to come out to her mom. Um, so that's this tape. It's not possible for me to fall in love with men. Why? I don't know. It's Is just not possible. Yeah, there's no trying. There's like, date. there's dating. That, I guess that's trying, but it just, you don't feel anything. And because you can't accept me as a whole person, I'm always gonna feel like I'm lacking this, this relationship. And I can't tell you everything because, so last month, December was a really hard month for me, but the things that were upsetting me, I can't tell you because it would make you happy even though it makes me sad. Why? Because there was a girl that I liked who didn't like me back. And I was really sad for a really long time, but I can't tell you that. Because you would just be happy that this wasn't happening for me. And so December was a really hard time. And why I wasn't home so often. But I couldn't tell you these things. Hmm. I understand. Um, I, I, whenever I play, whenever we play that tape or whenever I play that tape, I feel the need to thank Kathy wherever she is at the moment for sharing that. Currently she's in an isolated cabin in the woods, but so thank you, Kathy, for sharing that. Um, yeah, so as you can hear, that tape is like raw as hell. It's like very emotional, very deeply personal tape. Um, and, and it was like the thing that kicked off our show. So I, I feel like a thing we immediately learned is when you, if you are the reporter on these kinds of stories and it's your story and it's your very personal thing, um, you have to get an editor who you trust so 100% because it often happens that they will end up making creative decisions for you. You're too close to the thing to know what's interesting what's self-indulgent, you know, what details are important or unimportant. Um, so that editor who has one eye on your emotional well-being and then one eye on what's necessary for this story is like maybe the most crucial thing for figuring out stories that start with feelings. 
um, because they need to do that dance of, of taking care of you, but also first and foremost, prioritizing that this thing turns into something um, that is worthwhile to other people. Um, again, do get a therapist, but also get a great editor. Um, and then this last point, I think is just a thing that's worth asking um, whenever you're thinking about doing a story that's deeply personal, that's about your feelings. Um, what will someone else get out of this? Um, a lot of times, especially with Nancy, people would pitch us stories that were about the most personal stuff. And the thing we would find ourselves sitting around talking a lot about is, is this person ready to do a story about it or do they need therapy? Um, and I think what you're essentially exploring with that question is, um, is this person ready to tell the story in a way that it will be of use to other people? Um, this is the this is thing we figured out with ourselves too, because Kathy and I were often doing stories about ourselves. Um, and if we couldn't, what am I trying to say? There's, there's something tantalizing about just laying it bare, right? There's something tantalizing about somebody just being like, here's all my issues, here's my personal stuff, like here's my junk that I'm gonna mine for you. Um, but unless you can answer the question, what is someone else gonna get out of this? It's not worth it. It's like, it's self-indulgent, it's just um, cutting yourself open for that sake. Um, and the tricky thing is, an editor somewhere will say yes to you bearing your soul because it is interesting and it is tempting, right? But I think you as a creator, especially, uh, you know, I'm gonna speak to the, you know, marginalized identity folks in the room. There's a lot of temptation right now for editors to mine your pain or mine your experience for, you know, will you come in and do a story about this for me? Um, and I think unless you can answer this question, um, it's not worth it um, for your spirit or for your creativity or whatever. Um, yeah, so those are just like some of the things I have learned uh, in doing sort of like personal stories for the radio. Um, I would love to, first of all, figure out where my mouse went so I can stop sharing. Where did you go? Oh, there you are. No, nope, well, she disappeared again. While you're finding your mouse, we can all give you a round of applause and snaps and thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I think that was a very emotion-filled and very meaningful presentation for all of us. Thank you, Tobin. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, so helpful. Yeah, okay, let's jump into questions then. Let's, I don't see, Kat, you had one that I think Tobin answered. Do you wanna bring that back up? Oh, you're muted. You're, you're muted, my dear. Oh, still muted. Yeah. But I can, I can go ahead and point to your question, which one, one of the things you asked is, how much did I tell Sabri beforehand <laughs> yes. before we did that conversation? Good, this good. Is a great question. Here. Yeah. Um, this is a great question because I think it gets into consent with interviewing and I think a conversation that a lot of, I see a lot of podcasts and radio people talking about. Um, so to answer your question simply, I did not tell Sabri beforehand anything. I just said, I'm doing a story about body issues. Do you wanna come talk to me about it? He said, yes, we recorded it. And then because I did it that way, after we finished recording, um, I did for him what I would not normally do for an interviewee. I said, if you want me to kill this story now, I will kill it. Um, and he said, it's fine, just don't make me sound like an asshole. Um, so that for that story, that's how we did it. Um, I think in general, there's, um, there's like a very old school public radio-y thing, which is like, once the person says it on tape, you own it. And like, they can't come back and whatever, whatever. And I think there's a lot of, people having interesting conversations about consent and recording. I know, for example, Caitlin Press, who uh, does The Heart, she actually like goes back to her subjects and goes like beat, beat by beat of like, here's what's in there, here's whatever, and like sort of talks them through what the draft is gonna be. So it's like, 
I, I think it's a very personal question about consent and how you feel at peace with people you're interviewing. Um, but I see people making interesting different choices now, which I think is cool. Mm, that's so helpful. I know for our incubators tomorrow, we're talking about ethics and journalism. And yeah, it's a, that's a really good, good thing to note. Um, on that note, Natasha, who's in our incubator, asked, do you have a release that you have folks sign? Um, we don't. We don't. The, the thing we basically say to them beforehand is um, when you come into the studio or when I have the mic out, you have control. So if you want to say, um, if you say something and you're immediately like, I don't want that, don't use that, then I will obey that. Um, so while we are in the studio, the interviewee has control of the room and can tell me if they want to say something over, if they want to delete something, whatever. But once we leave that room, that's when I go make a creative thing. Now that that's not set in stone. Like I have um, for really sensitive stuff, gone back to the person and just been like, are you comfortable with this? Whatever, whatever. Um, I don't know. I feel like my personal gauge these days is like, would I be comfortable sitting in the room with that person listening to this story? Um, and if the answer is no, then I need to figure something else out about, you know, the consent with the tape and that sort of thing. That's great. Thank you. Um, hey, Karen, why don't you unmute and ask your question about music? Yeah, sure. I was just really picking up and noticing the music and the sound that you had sort of into and out of the clips and during them and then times when you didn't. So I was just curious um, what advice you have for using music and feeling these specific uh, stories and how that can help uh, or hinder perhaps the, the narrative and building tension and momentum. And thanks. Yeah. This was really wonderful and useful and valuable. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. Um, yeah, the music thing is really, it's tricky to figure out, especially with feelings -y stories, because what you can very easily end up doing is telling people how to feel, right? It's like, mm -hmm. if you throw something mushy under somebody saying something mushy, it's like you shouting like, cry, cry during this part, or like, you're supposed to be feeling happy now. Um, yeah, I don't think there's hard and fast rules. It's sort of a personal taste kind of thing. I tend to like music when I want to influence the space that someone is hearing a thing in. So what I mean is like, let's say I'm talking, let, let's say the radio story has me in a scene and I'm talking to some person and you're in that scene with me. And then for a couple lines of narration, I'm gonna sort of float above the scene and talk about what's happening inside my head or feelings. And I want the listener to sort of come with me above the space for a bit or like I kind of want to mess with their lens on what's happening, that's when I'll use music or that's when I'll try to put something underneath it. <clears throat> I think the other thing I tend to use music with for is uh, messing with people's sense of time. So if you need to, um, if your story is moving sort of along beat by beat and then you need to give them a sense of like time has passed or we're sort of going to another thing, then I'll use music to sort of whip you out of this idea that like it's day by day or moment by moment. Um, so those are just two examples of places where I tend to think like, okay, I think I need some music here and I'll. Um, this is a tip also that comes from Emily Botine, who's an editor at WNYC. Um, sometimes if she thinks she needs music, she will write to, she'll write down sort of like the emotion or the tone that she wants. And then she just clicks through music and sees how it feels against what she's written down. And if those two things jive, then she'll, um, then that's how she sort of like gets to picking music. I like that. Thanks, Tobin and Emily. That's great. Um, all right. So Jeremy, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my question, and I guess this is more for when you're telling someone else's story versus, you know, a few that you've shared where it's, where it's your story, but just curious, like when you're going into one of these interviews and thinking about the episode, do you have it pretty much planned out? Like the episode is going to go like this, you know, this is where the story arc is going to go, or do you kind of go in blind and just, you know, I, I, I guess hope that this, the story takes you where it wants to go. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I find that uh, 
it's basically yes to both. So you want to leave yourself open enough to being surprised and letting the story take you in a direction you didn't anticipate. But I, I personally won't go into a story unless I can kind of see all the beats of it or at least imagine where it could go. Um, because, and I should say, I go into stories often having imagined beats and it very rarely actually turns out that way. So you kind of go in having a structure in mind, being willing to throw it all out. But the reason that you structure beforehand is sort of the same reason I was talking about like having the question lined out before you go in, into these recordings or whatever, is because then all the tape you're getting is moving towards a goal. It's like it, you have a purpose in mind for why you're asking questions, why you're getting tape. So then your, your tape will have momentum to it, as opposed to any time that I've sort of gone on like fishing expeditions of talking to somebody and just like recording and seeing what happens and blah, 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 blah. I like go back and listen to two hours of like nothing. It's just like, we just like sort of sat around and didn't do anything. So that, I think that's why it's important to like structure beforehand and then be willing to throw it all out when the tape surprises you. Great. Um, Kat, you want me to read your question? Or, okay. <laughs> um, Kat, do you, Kat asks, do you feel like you need to build rapport or intimacy with your audience before dropping more personal stories? Or do you feel that it's a good idea to start with the most personal stories to set the stage? Oh. Um, I could see reasons for doing either one. I will say for Nancy, we started right out the gate with our very personal stories. Um, and I think it did two things for us. One, it introduced us to the audience in a very nice way. So they sort of felt like they knew us immediately in a very deep way. Um, and then I think the other thing that was nice about doing it that way is that it, it sort of like threw the gauntlet down of like, well, we did this, like we, we sort of talked about very personal stuff. So, it opens up the space for future guests and future reporters or producers to, we sort of like created the space already for that. And, and then we weren't asking anyone to do something that we hadn't done ourselves. Um, so for us, that's kind of why we went that direction. But I could see it going either way. Um, not necessarily starting with the hottest, like most personal stuff. Um, but yeah, that's sort of how we decided to do it. Cool, thank you. Cat nods approval. Um, okay, so then Natasha, do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um, my question is, so when you're interviewing someone and these are like really delicate topics that you're talking about and someone's getting super emotional, how do you respond? Like maybe they yeah. start crying or? Um, I, I often think that I am trying to mirror whatever somebody is throwing down. So I guess what I would say is whenever somebody, like if somebody gets really emotional and they start crying, I try to just sit with them in that space. Cause actually it's kind of the same, it's kind of the same thing you would do for a friend, right? It's like when someone starts crying, the worst thing you can say to them is like, stop, no, stop crying or like, you know, whatever, like actually the most supportive thing and the thing you can do to create space is just to sort of sit with them in that space. Um, and so I think that means a couple of things. One, I try not to talk. Like if someone gets emotional, I try not to say anything and just let them work it out however they're gonna work it out. I think that's really important. Um, yeah, because I think also then that sets a tone that it's okay for them to be emotional in that space. It's not making you uncomfortable, like you're okay sitting with them. Um, and then if I'm being sort of putting my cynical reporter producer hat on, it's just much better tape, right? Like if, if the person um, gets emotional and is allowed to sort of talk all of that out, that's much more interesting stuff to work with on, on the other side. Um, so yeah, I, I think in one instance, I, I think in some instances, if the person is really emotional and really losing it, it is right and totally fine to say, do you need to take a break? Do you need to take a minute? Um, but I think that's sort of your personal gauge too. 
Great. Uh, looks like we have one more here. Suzanne, you have a tech, some technical questions. Jump on in. And then, Bo, I saw your hand coming for you next. Yes, um, I'm so sorry to ask all these technical questions because the emotional questions are totally um, superb. But mine, uh, because I, I have no experience whatsoever, when you interview your participants for you know the show, and two of them are remote, they're, they're not in a studio, do you recommend um, like a Zoom H? Uh, was it H4, H6, or something like that? Uh, I didn't know what the mechanics were that you use for your show, and along with that, like any editing software that you use. And then the last question was, it sort of follows what uh, Karen was saying about the music. When you take snippets of music, do you have to have, go through a legal process to take snippets, to ask permission, and all this other stuff? Or is it something where you can just take snippets and just insert them? that kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is, I'll, I'll answer the music question first, because okay. this is where I will, I will own my privilege. I'm very lucky to work at a place that has per, like composers and engineers oh. on staff. So nice. a lot of our music is written for us, which is like yeah. stupid lucky. Because yeah. I think if you're out, if you're out there doing it on your own, you do have a lot of issues about, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, being able to use whatever. Um, I did get an email recently that the Free Music Archive is coming back, which is oh, kind of okay. exciting. That used to be like the place to go. I don't know if anyone ever used Paddington Bear, but uh, he was like the composer <laughs> who had his music <laughs> available. Um, so if that comes back, that's gonna be great. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> generally speaking, yeah, there's a lot of rights rail guards mm -hmm. around music and when you can and can't use it. Um, that being said, I will say, at least for a while, I don't know if this is the case anymore, there were a lot of sound engineers who were interested in getting in the podcast game. And if you could at least find your way to one of them and you're sort of mutually trying to get stuff going, um, there's a lot of talent out there that's like sort of interested in learning with producers or learning with reporters. And so would might be interested in like cutting their teeth on writing some music or helping you know you assemble a show I, I don't know what i don't i don't know the the scope of your project but that that's just a thing i've seen other people do okay. um to your technical questions uh i um we edit in pro tools which is a big unruly beast but seems to be the uh industry standard um I've also edited in Hindenburg and Reaper is another one that people seem to really love and is free. So if you're um, looking for something that you can download, uh, no cost, I believe Reaper is free. Reaper. Um, in terms of the mic situation before COVID, you know, whenever we could, we would have people come into the studio or uh, send a tape sinker to record them in quality on their end. Interestingly now, um, because we're often interviewing people in their home and don't wanna have to make them mess with a bunch of technical stuff. The setup we have is we generally have them put in earbuds to talk to us through the computer or whatever. And then we mm. actually just have them record a voice memo holding the phone like they normally would mm. uh, for a, a thing and then email it to you directly from the phone afterwards. Oh. And it's actually, pretty high quality. It's like shockingly high quality to have somebody do a voice memo on their phone. Um, and then you just sync it later. So that's, that's the technology we're rocking with now. And I think actually could work for a lot of podcasters who are doing it. Yeah, indie. Great, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. We also, um, we have a YouTube video from um, an early class right at the beginning of the pandemic with Mia Warren where she talked about interviewing remotely. So I'll be sure you guys get a copy of that as well. You all get a copy of that. Um, Bo, thank jump you. on in. Hello, hello. Um, so my question is about receiving pitches from um, individuals to share their stories. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience is like and how you solicit um, a call for those stories and just kind of what the, the framework for that is? Yeah. Um, 
So we, we did take freelance pitches from outside reporters. Um, one thing that we found was super helpful for us is especially once we had gotten a couple, we um, on our website put up an example of what was a great pitch for us. So I, I think it's so hard to pitch places, especially if they don't kind of tell you what they're looking for or they have a general thing. It's like, I don't know what I'm highlighting. I don't know what I'm trying to tell these people. So if you are looking to solicit pitches from people, it's great to just say, I need X, Y, and Z, and here's an example of a great pitch for me that's gonna work great for me. Because oftentimes too, what we would find is people would pitch us and it was like a formatting thing. Like if they just wrote it a different way or highlighted different things, it would work great. Um, so I'll, uh, I would say first and foremost, like the, the clearer you can be with people about just what you need out of them, you're gonna get more successful pitches from them. Um, I personally just feel like um, if somebody pitches a very personal thing um, and there's a chance it'll work, uh, this is something we did for Nancy. If, if someone pitched a very personal thing and there was a chance that it would work for us, we would just get on the phone to talk to them about it. We would try not to just like vote in the room and say yes or no. Um, because depending on the content, like, Sometimes somebody just needs to talk out something and then you get to what the story is. Um, and it's hard to like capture in writing. Um, so I, I guess, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say there is like pay attention to if the story someone is pitching you might be hard to capture in writing and if it's worth just getting on the phone talking to them. Um, I don't know, are there other aspects of it that you're interested in in terms of like soliciting pitches or how to work with uh, reporters? Well, I was, you mentioned um, that when you guys were doing Nancy, you started with your very own personal stories. And then you mentioned that you guys had done, um, I think a hundred episodes. So getting from that, from that yeah. initial start to having that constant, um, these new stories, these riveting stories, how did you go about just saying, hey, or you can maybe answer what was that flow like in the beginning where people were presenting these ideas and as the popularity of the show grew, how did you manage the size of, of pitches you received? Yeah, um, so we we always knew because of the the episode order, because of how many we were expected to make, there was no way that like just the at the time it was three of us making the show, we're gonna fulfill all of the um, episodes. So we uh, uh, we wrote up the like pitch guidelines that I was talking about. We hit up as many of like the radio listservs as we could just to say, hey, we're a show, this is what we're looking for, pitch us. Um, and that's a great way because there's so many people out there that just have floating things that um, will help. Um, and then I think, to be totally honest, um, when we started the show, and I think when any show starts, you're like figuring out what it is for a while, right? Like you're kind of like figuring it out as you go. And so to be totally honest, we didn't have, we didn't have a ton of outside pitches when we started the show. Um, uh, which, is, uh, which is what I mean to say is we didn't take a lot of outside pitches when we first started the show because it sort of felt like we had to define what it was first. And then we could go to other people and say, this is a Nancy story, pitch us a Nancy story. Um, so I think that in the life of a new thing might be something to consider that, you know, you're already coming up against so many creative challenges, just trying to make a new thing that it's worth letting yourself do that before you sort of invite the outside to come in. Incubator participants, you get, you feel that creative challenges of starting a new thing. <laughs> um, cool. So there's another question I have here. Um, so what about for those who maybe struggle getting from information to emotions and to drawing people into a story? Um, how do you maybe advise around bringing the emotional aspect and identifying feelings within kind of a world of information? Um, 
Yeah, this is a great question. And my, my dog is drinking water in the background if you're hearing like lapping happening. Um, um, in that instance, I actually, um, Radiolab does this really great thing that I think is useful, um, especially when you're in the phase where you like are working on something and you have all this information in your head and you're like, how am I gonna turn this into something? Um, they do what's called a brain dump which is basically like you're at the phase where you have all the stuff in your head and then you just go record yourself telling it all to somebody else, like your editor or like another, just somebody you creatively trust. Um, and you tell it to them with no notes in front of you, like don't bring in any notes, don't bring in any information, just what's in your head. And you just tell it to them as you would you, to a friend or somebody you're trying to get interested in this thing. Um, and for Radiolab, they actually like use that as the raw material for how they make their episodes. That might not be what you end up doing, but I think what you find out of that tape is you hear how you would tell it if you were just telling it to someone on the street. Um, you hear what's interesting, like you hear what the other person reacts to, and then that's, that's sort of telling you like, oh, okay, this beat of the story is really interesting. This other beat of the story they could care less about. Um, so you start to realize, like, what are the things that make your thing interesting? Um, and then also, you know, you just hear yourself talk as you normally would, and that's how you should sound. So um, using that is really invaluable, um, I find, to sounding like a human. Yes, especially when getting in front of the mic for the first couple times, right? You're like, yes. oh, what do I do with this thing? Um, Great. Other questions? I don't see any unless I'm missing some. Oh, Lauren, I see you. Hop on in. All right. Hi. Um, been a big Nancy fan, so excited to be here. Um, and sad the show's wrapped up. Um, but I am actually curious a little bit more about your personal story, Tobin, like sort of personal, professional hybrid um, of like how um how you got into radio like how did you find transom and then how did that segue into working for um uh marketplace and so on and so forth um and then also if you could also speak to um like how the different um the different ways that emotion has affected your producing in those different roles mm, gotcha um, yeah, well, okay, so, so before radio, I actually was a professional cellist. Uh, I went to music school and, um, originally moved to New York to, like, go to music school, and, um, I, uh, was doing gigs around the city. I played in the New Haven Symphony. That was sort of my life, uh, and I, as soon as I got out of school, I, like, hated it, and it was, it was this really rude awakening of like, oh man, I've spent most of my life training to do this thing and now I'm doing it professionally and it is killing me um, and making me really unhappy. And around that time is when I fell in love with Radiolab um, and I was lucky enough to be seeing a therapist at the time and she said to me, uh, you've come in here every week and talked about how miserable you are and then you talked about this Radiolab episode and you got more excited than I've like ever seen you. And so that was like my light bulb moment of like, oh, uh, this, this, this is something people do and maybe I should do that. Um, the way I got into radio is I, so I turned my classical music experience into an internship at the classical music station at WNYC um, and worked for this little like contemporary music 24 hour streaming station and just like ripped CDs for six hours a day um, so that was my first like gig in radio, uh, and I realized very quickly that that would not get me over to like Radio Lab or the newsroom or whatever. Um, so at the time, like I would say this was especially true at the time, uh, like Transom was the place to go if you were interested in like public radio reporting in the most pure sense. So I sort of applied and um, that's where I did, you know, my seven weeks of training. Um, and out of that, I was able to get a, a, I had to start over, basically. I got an internship at Marketplace. Um, 
And I just, I got really lucky that while I was there, uh, they started pulling me to do digital stuff and like social media and interweb stuff. And then uh, pretty quickly within six months of me being there, the entire digital team quit. So I got a job as the overnight digital PA going to work at 5.30 a.m. to run the website. And I was like, I basically was like, cool, I'm in the building. I can pitch them stories. And so I just like became a pitch monster and pitched as much freelance stuff as I could. Um, and so that's how I sort of like cut my teeth in the beginning. And then, I don't know, I often say that like my journey is not, there's not a lot about it to follow for another person because honestly, the next step after that is that Kathy and I won a competition. We, we essentially pitched Nancy to this open call for show ideas at WNYC um, and we won it and that's how Nancy came to be. And then along the way, while we were sort of waiting for it to launch, I went and did more perfect for a season and then um, Nancy. So that's sort of like the trajectory of that. Um, to answer your question about emotion, it's interesting because not until I did Nancy um, was any of my personal stuff in stories. Right? Like I was very much a reporter and a producer behind the scenes. Um, and then we pitched Nancy and honestly, in our original pitch, we weren't that, Kathy and I weren't that present in the show. We didn't think that we would be, we thought we would be hosts in as much as like, we would guide you from point A to point B, but we didn't think we were like personalities. And then as we developed the show with WNYC, one of the biggest things they changed was saying like, no, you are the show. Like you are, it's your lens on everything. Um, and that was like, that was that was so helpful, and it honestly made the show really what it was. So, I that's that is a piece of advice like I try to give people is like especially if you're starting something that is your baby, that is like your project, the more you can bring of yourself to it, the more it has a like has a point of view. Because um, actually, if you think about it, like when I look at my podcast feed, like I like shows. I like the content that they cover, but at the end of the day, it's like, do I like the hosts? Like, do I want to spend time with them? Like, that's kind of what brings you back to a podcast, right? So like, mm -hmm. that's, that that I have learned from making Nancy is, is so important. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Chat is yelling via chat box. Listen, the truth is here. <laughs> and trying to be your voice here, Chat. <laughs> it's so good. Javon, were you raising your hand? Or were you just like, wait, just like, I agree. I don't know. Okay, cool. Um, any other questions? This has been so packed with goodies. Ah, uh, there you are. <laughs> Changed my mind. <laughs> um, yeah, I, thanks for being here, by the way. This is so awesome. So much great information. And um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on like imposter syndrome and sort of feeling that, um, like, am I the right person to, to make this show, you know, mm. maybe past that. It's so real. <laughs> it's so real. Um, I know I'm not the first person to say this, and not to throw anyone under the bus, but I think the first question you should ask yourself is, is this a question that a straight white man would ask himself? And if the answer is no, then don't ask yourself that question. So, I mean, I think we're all familiar with mm -hmm. the way podcasting as an environment looks and what most of the hosts look and sound like. And that is a whole room full of people who didn't stop to ask themselves, am I the right person to do this? Um, uh, so I know it's easier said than done, but it is, it is something to keep in mind as just sort of like a first stop when you're feeling that feeling. Um, and then I guess to go back to sort of the answer to the last question about making it personal, it's like, if you come to something with your lens on it, which only you have, and you're bringing that, then you are the right person to host it because it is your lens, right? It's like the imposter syndrome applies if you're trying to be somebody else and you're trying to like bring a different, and like if you're trying to be, uh, if you're trying to be like Ira Glass and host like Ira Glass, then absolutely you should have that imposter syndrome because like 
there's only one Ira Glass and there should only be one Ira Glass. You know, like there's room for a lot other of other kinds of personalities. So I think um, it's important to move towards feeling like you have a unique point of view. And as long as you're moving towards that, then you are the right person to be hosting the thing you're making. That's awesome. That makes so much sense. I mean, even just bringing in like, what a straight white dude <laughs> ask that question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, there's another question in the chat and then I'll give a final call for one or two more questions. Um, Susan, Amelia, I don't, do you wanna unmute yourself? Ask your question or I can do it for you. Okay, the question is, is social media a place where you build community and drive listeners to Nancy? So maybe talk some branding with us, branding marketing. Yeah, um, absolutely. It was, that was huge for us. Um, I think especially, I think in season two, we did a whole project around this idea of um, queer people finding chosen family. And we challenged listeners to like do this series of things to meet people and build their, we called it a gaggle of um, other queer folks. And that turned into us starting like a private Facebook group for the fans to find each other. And then they went off and created their own private Facebook groups based on like cities they lived in. So there was like the Austin gaggle, the Seattle gaggle, whatever. And they would use it as a space to like talk about meetups and going to events together. Um, and I think what that did for us, which was huge, is it gave the listeners a piece of the show that they owned and that they controlled. And, um, and so their connection to the show was that much deeper because beyond just listening to us and listening to the episodes, suddenly we were like part of their social lives too. And suddenly we were part of them like finding friends and um, they could organize on behalf of the show. Um, so that was huge. I think the the use of social media to let people take ownership of their fandom was great because it's like you're building community even when you're not putting out episodes. Um, so that's, I think, really useful, really helpful. Perfect. Um, ooh, here's a good one. Um, how did you test your content on audiences early on? Did you get their feedback and input on how and if your content was serving them? Uh, yes. There's sort of two answers to this question. <coughs> um, the first question is we got, we had the benefit. And if you have the, if you have this ability, do this for yourself. We gave ourselves a long runway before we actually started putting out episodes. It was like a couple months. Um, and what that allowed us to do is what I think any new podcast should do, which is make a lot of things and kill a lot of things. Um, because we, you know, like you creatively, you have this idea in your head and you have this idea of what it's supposed to be. And oftentimes the first thing you have to do is make that so that you can see that's not what it's supposed to be. And then you can get it out of the way and move towards the other thing. So what we did a lot of when we were first starting the show and incubating it is we made a lot of just like short segments um, and we would listen to it and sort of ask ourselves and we would play them for people like, does this sound like something we wanna make long-term? Does it not? Um, so we were moving through content really fast when we first started and that eventually led to the, um, what became our first couple episodes. The other thing I would say is you know, making a new thing is hard. And especially when you start putting it out into the world, the feedback loop is hard. Um, it's very, you, you can feel very exposed. So one piece of advice that we got, got early on that was great was let yourself basically just put your head down and make a, several before you revisit this question of audience feedback. So for us, it was like, we're just gonna make a season and see how it goes and then look back on the season in terms of like what people responded to, what worked well, what didn't work well. And that's really, that was really, I mean, this is another radio lab thing. Um, they call it sort of like a show Bible. Um, so what we did is at the end of the first season, we looked back at the, uh, the episodes and we identified the moments and the like 
the bits of tape, the style, the sound, just things that felt core to like, okay, this is what we're trying to do. And we wrote it down and that became like the beats of like, this is what the Nancy Show Bible is. We know that when we do an episode, it needs to have X, Y, and Z because we've identified it. Um, and you can't, you can't do that until you have the benefit of having made enough to sort of look back and evaluate. Um, so I would say, give yourself also the gift of being able to make a couple before you start to be critical of it. Mm-hmm. That is good. That is very good. Okay, final questions. We are wrapping up. Uh, practical question, where and how have you found your best editors? And I'm gonna add slash teammates. And then we'll close with a, with a final question after that. Oh man, well, to be honest, we got very lucky when we started because our staff at the beginning was just sort of given to us. It was like who at the station was floating and could be sort of assigned to us. So we didn't, but then we lucked out because they were amazing and they, they really helped us make the thing well. Um, I think I have found that when we were interviewing or considering bringing people into the team, you know, you go in having a really strong ideas about what technical skills they need to have or what like sort of skill set they need to bring to the table. But at the end of the day, like if they just felt good, like as a person and like sort of felt like whole as a person, then that's who often ended up being the best person. Um, and I and I think sometimes um, I don't want I don't want to misconstrue what I'm saying because I think sometimes that excuse has been used to like bring in the same kind of people or bring in people who are unqualified or whatever. Um, I think for us it was that like because we had mandates for ourselves that we wanted to work like primarily with people of color and queer people if we could, like some of that was just prioritizing like okay maybe this person on paper doesn't have x y and z that this other person has but they are so like they feel right for the show and they feel like like i can teach you how to be better at pro tools i can't teach you how to get what the show is trying to do um so i think paying attention to that is uh important especially if you have sort of like a mission driven something cool that's great all right final question what are you most looking forward to producing moving forward? What is your North Star? Oh, man. You're, you're kind of catching me when I don't know the answer to that. Because the last four years of my life has been Nancy. And this really mission-driven, really, like, um, sort of, like, I don't know. I, I think... Uh, it has, you know, what, I'm, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, you know, like I've had it defined for me for the last four years, right? And like, it just ended on Monday. And so now I'm like sort of in this big wilderness sort of space. But I will say, I think Nancy taught me that if at the end of the day, I could feel like I was telling somebody's story in an honest way, in a way that they would want to tell it. And, um, just with that quality, that's something I never want to lose. Like, I never want to lose that feeling, that qualitative feeling. Um, and so that's as much as I know right now. Everything else is sort of like big and amorphous, and I don't know exactly what yet it'll be. I love that answer. One more. Oh, cat, cat's keeping them coming. Fine. Okay, real last one. The real last one. What is your advice for new producers? The environment is different from when you, do you want me to keep reading this? Cat? <laughs> the environment's different from when you came in. Yeah. Now you're going back out into it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, my advice for new producers is don't shortchange yourself on um, what you have to offer. Um, because I think for me, when I started, the environment truly was, if you got a public radio job, 
like working on one of the shows, you died in that job because there was not a lot of movement. There was not a lot of opportunity. It was like, you get a thing, you sink your claws in. And, and so getting to that thing often meant just like taking whatever scraps they would give you to do that. And I think to be honest, like to put especially public radio on blast, like a lot of houses still operate as if that's the case, like as if they can afford to make somebody be a perma temp forever or um, intern forever. Um, but I don't think that's like the podcasting space is still booming and there's so many people interested in making stuff that if you have some technical skill and some know-how and the interest, um, don't sell yourself short with somebody who wants to pay you nothing to make a thing. Um, so I think that's really important. I think it's a thing that I hope people are moving away from is taking the table scraps opportunities where it's like somebody to, somebody essentially asking you to make like 20 episodes for no money and whatever, whatever, like you shouldn't have to do that, especially if you are walking in the door with technical skill and, and whatnot. Thank you. All right, folks, go ahead and unmute yourself to say thank you to round of applause. Tobin, thank you so much. Woo! Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was such a gift to have you. All right, everyone, this will be on Facebook. The recorded piece will be on Facebook and um, we'll put it up on YouTube too. All right, take care, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.